Umilitam yena tas my Sri Guruvena Maha. Uma Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prastaya Bhutale. Sri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamine. Namaste Saraswati Devi. Gorvali Pacharine ne Nirasesa Sunyavari Pastyat Yare Sutarine. Once you go but to Rubisja, Kripa Sindhu, the Eva Jack, the Titan on Pavane Bio, Vaishnava Bio, the Mahona Maha, Jai Sri Krishna, Chaitanya, Prabhu Nityananda, Sri Advaita, Gadadar, Sivasari Gor, Bhakta Rinda, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Um, so yesterday was the Divine Appearance Day of His Holiness, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Maharaj, uh, the beloved spiritual master of our spiritual master, Srila Prabhupada. And so yesterday we, uh, we spoke a little bit about His glories and some of the principles that he taught and he lived by. And uh, there is an unlimited ocean of material available on his life, his teachings. Uh, so I'd like to uh, go a little bit more into some of the statements that Maharaj has said, which are like, PowerPoint presentations on various philosophical and spiritual principles. And uh, so I'll do that and begin our class on that. So we might say these are words of wisdom from His Holiness, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. And these are somewhat similar, but also different from what we spoke yesterday. And as we developed a certain protocol yesterday, we should follow that protocol today. And that is that as I'm speaking, you may anytime come and say something, speak out, interrupt, and uh, comment or ask a question based on what's being said or what was being said as I'm speaking along. <clears throat> so don't feel like you're interrupting because this, the idea is to create some type of discussion because by discussing, we bring out more of the points. <laughs> I can speak and I will go, can also explain things, but there's a limit when other minds, others' intelligence uh, enter, then there is more opportunity to learn. So we want to create that environment again. So please, you can speak out. So I'll read. And uh, this is the first, these are like PowerPoints. We are put to test and trial in this world. So that's a complete statement. We are put to test and trial in this world. Only those who attend the kirtan of the devotees can succeed. Hmm. So what is he saying? That the Yuga Dharma, the Harinam Sankirtan, is the panacea to rise above and to what we might say, be free from all of the difficulties that are placed upon us by our sojourn in this world. Uh, sometimes people think everything should go the way I want it to go, but that's, that's some kind of daydream. That doesn't happen to anybody in the world. <laughs> uh, the world works under the 
complete guidance of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And Krishna puts the energies into place and they work accordingly. So this material world is created by the Lord. It's truly his agencies, his representatives, and it's managed by them also. And so this world works accordingly to the to the workings of the three modes of material nature, goodness, passion, and ignorance. And so things are always changing. One of the th factors about the material world that is constant is change. Change is a constant thing. Things keep changing. If it's hard to keep something from not changing, it's not hard, it's impossible because that's the nature of the energy that it brings something about, moves something along, and then ultimately creates something else. So this is the nature of this world. So tests, trials, tribulations, uh, successes, failures, all of these are part of living in this world. And it says here, the kirtan, those who attend the kirtan can succeed to somehow or other free themselves, not just partially, but completely from the uh, trials and tests of this world, because they're situated on the topmost part of Krishna conscious realization, absorbed in the holy name of the Lord. <laughs> well, that's the first statement he makes. The second one he says, Every spot on earth where discourses on God are held is a place of pilgrimage. Hmm. I think there was a similar statement that was made yesterday that wherever there is glorification of God, that is a holy place. So this world is not a holy place, but it's made holy through the presence of the Lord, the presence of the Lord's devotees who glorify the Lord and serve the Lord. And wherever that's done, that is a tirta. Tirta means a place where you go and it's not a part of this world. Although it may appear to be within the world, the energy that is present within the tirta is transcendental because wherever there's discourses of Krishna, Krishna is personally present. As Krishna says also, um, I'm not in the heart of the yogis. I am not in my abode by Kunta. Where am I? Wherever my devotees are glorifying me, that's where I am. So we can, we can hear, we see, and wherever there's glorification of the Lord, the, the Lord is personally present. Mm -hmm. And that means that place is a holy place. Mm -hmm. Okay, so number three, possession of objects not related to Krishna is our main malady. Malady means something that is an anomaly and something that works against us. <laughs> so the tendency of the conditioned soul is to try to control and possess so many things. And Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati says, anything that's not related to Krishna, and that is not just physical objects, that's activities also is our main malady. Okay. So if there's no questions on the first three, I'll go on to the next four. Number four. Uh, Guru Maharaj, if I may just ask a question about number three, please. How is it that any object is not related to Krishna? Because everything is related to Krishna and everything is meant to be used in his service. So when we well, say- Try to understand what he's saying. 
He's saying th things not used in the service of Krishna is our main malady. Or things that cannot be related to Krishna. <laughs> things that are not used, cannot be used in the service of the Lord. Such as uh, activities in the modes of passion and ignorance. Or objects that indicate our desires to enjoy the material energy in these modes of passion and ignorance. Everything is created by Krishna, but then through the process of material consciousness, we separate those items and we try to enjoy them separately or use them separately. In other words, we don't make Krishna the goal of our activities. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, number four, let me not desire anything but the highest good for my worst enemies. Hmm. So here is, a, here is a principle of the highest form of consciousness, one who does not see anyone as their enemy. As Prabhupada said, people will make us their enemy, but we should not make anyone our enemy. Uh, Bhakti, and I'm sorry, Shilohari Das Thakur, when he was being beaten in 22 marketplaces, he never considered these people to be his enemy. In fact, he was praying for their, as it says here, their highest good. He was praying that they would receive the mercy of the Lord. So, he doesn't say he's on that platform. He's saying, let me not desire anything. So let my desire always be for the highest good for everyone, including my worst enemies. As number five, as dalliance with the body and luxury increases, so wanes the spirit of service to the Lord. So there's a limit. We have to take care of the body. But beyond that, if we spend time too much in bodily affairs, bodily in treatments, bodily activities, the spirit of Krishna service decreases. It's like an automatic thing. Mm -hmm. So Krishna has said, you know, you have to take care, not too much, not too little, to the needs of the body. There are some people who like to take care of health 24 hours a day. There are some people who like to always think what is happening to my body and mind 24 hours a day? But there's others who are thinking in terms of how to serve Krishna, what will make Krishna happy, how to use what Krishna has given me in his service. They are not thinking so much on the badly platform, or even at all. Okay, so that's number five. Number six is interesting. This one kind of scares devotees. This was Bhakti Siddhanta. He, he spoke the truth, the plain truth. Those favored by God find their path strewn with thorns. Those favored by God find their path strewn with thorns. And so for those who are especially favored by the Lord, the Lord gives them many, many challenges. If we're not being challenged, it means really we're not getting the Lord's favor. <laughs> because for one who is serious on the path of devotional service, 
these challenges, difficulties, reverses, obstacles, or opportunities to offer more devotion to the, to the Lord and to move forward in knowledge and renunciation. If we're not getting these things, that means we are really not really nicely engaged in devotional service. But if Krishna wants to favor you, as probably Prabhupada used to say, if Krishna wants to favor you, he gives you many things. If he really wants to favor you, then he takes things away. Okay. So that may be hard for us to stand. We sometimes we see reverses difficulties as as something that is undesirable, but a devotee can take any situation and connect it and turn it into something Krishna conscious. It's just a matter of consciousness. That's it. And requires some intelligence also. And that's available through Guru Shadu and Shastra. Number seven. Any questions about the first six so far? Okay, number seven. There is no peace or happiness in our worldly life. Circumstances create turmoil and annoyance. <laughs> so those who try to be happy and peaceful in this material world are not, it's not possible. It's just circumstances are always Turn, full of turmoil or they create bothersome situations. Just the way the world is. Some people say, well, why is it like that? That's like saying, well, why is it cold in the wintertime? Because it's the winter. Why is there no happiness and peace in the material world? Because it's the material world. <laughs> so that's how it works. Number eight, chant the Maha Mantra loudly and with attachment. This drives away inertia, worldly evils, and pests. <laughs> Interesting. Chant the Maha Mantra loudly with attachment. This will drive away inertia, worldly evils, and pests. Mm -hmm. So the loud chanting of the holy name of the Lord will scare away the evils of this world bothersome people and a general sense of inertia that may come upon mm -hmm. and we can experience that when we start chanting loudly continuously and become attached to that you'll see you'll experience that your inertia is gone if there's any disturbance in, in your, your minds those things are gone and people that might want to bother you will no longer be around. <laughs> okay, number nine. Be indifferent to worldly gossip. Stick firmly to your cherished goals. No lack of impediments of the world will ever stand in your way. Gossip. It's the sickness of the mind is gossip. Have to speak about something or someone just for the sake of talking, talk, 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 talk. All of us said like, like the frog, he's crowing. And the snake is singing, oh, it's thinking, oh, here is lunch. Okay. So the, the, the croaking of the frog is calling the snake and the snake comes. So this worldly gossip that people like to talk about, and Prabhupada said, you know, like, it's so important. It's, you know, just, it's just wasting time, wasting energy, and filling the mind with useless, and what we say, uh, 
annoying forms of sound. <laughs> and then he goes on, stick to your cherished goals. No lack of impediments of the world will ever stand in your way. So of course, for us, our cherished goal is our devotional service. Pay due respects to the extroverts of the world. Do not, but do not be appreciative of their manners and conduct. They are to be shaken off from your mind. Mm -hmm. Pay due respects to the extroverts of the world. Those who want to make a show of worldly activity. Do not be appreciative of their manners and their conduct. They are to be shaken off from your mind. So what does it mean to pay due respects? Well, we acknowledge they're there and that's all. But we're not interested in their conduct and their manners. They may look good from a worldly point of view, but the Bodhi knows that good qualities are found only in those who engage in devotional service. Okay, one second, I just need to take care of something. Mm -hmm. So, lunch today is just small side. I had avocado from this morning, so everything else in order to do it. Okay. Give me a little lemon too. Mm -hmm. That's all, not too big. Okay, number 11. A devotee feels the presence of God everywhere, but one of verse to the Lord denies his existence everywhere. Hmm. So God is, is revealed through our consciousness. One who's averse to God, he'll find so many reasons to deny his existence or deny that, well, he might exist, but he has nothing, I have nothing that I can, I have no business with God. <laughs> there are some people who actually hate the presence of God and work against those who are godly and then, but a devotee knows that Krishna says, I'm, I'm, in, I'm, I'm within every atom. I'm outside of my every atom. I'm in, I'm in the hearts of all living entities. I exist also within my spiritual realm. God is everywhere. Directly or indirectly through his energies. But he's also there he can also be present personally through his energy also, if he wants to. Okay. Uh, number 12, you cannot appreciate transcendental matters with the reasoning of your world. It is sheer nonsense to decry them with the measuring stick of your intellect. You cannot appreciate transcendental matters with the reasoning of the world. It is sheer nonsense to decry them with the measuring stick of your intellect. Measuring stick, reasoning, logic, trying to appreciate transcendental matter, matter, matters through the empiricism of worldly existence. This is opposite. You can't understand. In other words, people say, well, they use logic and reason to say that God does not exist. They use logic and reason to say that the activities of God are simply imagination. The stories related to the Lord's pastimes are simply someone's creation. And using 
mundane ideas, feelings, calculations to try to apply them onto transcendental matters is futile. It's like it's like a little child trying to fully understand his father. <laughs> he might see his father, but he can't understand him completely because he's a child. He may know something you now. Okay, number 13. To recite the name of Sri Krishna is bhakti. Hmm. That's self-explanatory. To recite the name of Sri Krishna, that's bhakti. <laughs> Number 14, life is for the glorification of the topics of Hari. If that is stopped, then what need is there to carry on life? Oh. So we understand that life means spirit. Matter has no life of itself. Spirit means to glorify the Lord. So glorifying the Lord is life or to live in glorification for the Lord is life. When if that is not there, then there is no life. And then what is the need to do anything else because everything else has no value? <laughs> or not only no value, it has no benefit at all. In fact, it works against one. <laughs> Number 13, number 15, I'm sorry. Physical illness with Hari Bhajan is preferred to physical fitness without Hari Bhajan. So that's pretty much, if you're, if you're, if you're physically fit, but you're not doing anything devotional, that's one thing. But if you're doing Hari Bhajan, even if you're not well, that is preferred. So people put physical fitness over glorification of the Lord. But we put glorification of the Lord above everything else. Mm -hmm. Number 16. Our life on earth is short. I'm sorry, our, life's, our span of life on earth is short. Our life will be crowned with success if the body wears out with constant discourses on Hari. On Hari. Now we hear the story of the Srimad Bhagavatam Maharaj Pariksit, hearing from Sukadeva Goswami constantly for seven days. He was, his body was about to leave him in a few days, but he was absorbed in hearing and the discourses of the, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So his life was perfect. <laughs> because that means that at the end of the life, one will go back to the spiritual world. So life is short, especially in Kali Yuga. It's been, been made very short. And as Kali Yuga progresses, these lifespan will be also decreased more and more. So um, use your time, the body will wear out, no question. It's not like keeping the body fit for what? The only reason to keep the body fit is for hearing and chanting and serving the Supreme Lord. Number 17. We are here on earth not to work as artisans for making big buildings with wood and stone, but to work only as messengers for the teachings of Sri Chaitanya Dev. Hmm. So now we're not interested in, in con contributing to the worldliness of the world. We're interested in hearing and spreading the, the messages of Lord Chaitanya. That is our happiness. That is our progress towards eternal life. <clears throat> Whatever you do on the material level is 
closed by time. Time takes everything away. The constant here is change. And change means deterioration. <clears throat> so nothing in this world has, will stay. So why waste time? <clears throat> Prabhupada tells the story of one sadhu, whose name was Lomasa Rish. Lomasa Rish. Lomasa Rish had a benediction that for every hair on his body, he would live one lifetime of Brahma. Now that number is incalculable. <laughs> so um, he had that special benediction. And so he would do his bhajan on the banks of the holy rivers. So he had a few followers. And one day that his followers came to him and said, Guru Maharaj, you know, you're doing bhajan here outside all the time. Can we build you a, a kutir, a place where you can live and stay and take care of your affairs? He says, don't bother. <clears throat> I'm not going to be here very long. <laughs> so what is he saying that... Um, in connection with eternal time, life in this material world is so short that it's immeasurable. Mm -hmm. You can measure the tip of a hair and even measure a tip of a tip of a hair. The measurements now that scientists have discovered can go to the smallest, smallest of all uh, items, particles, but <clears throat> that is that is much larger than our <laughs> time on Earth because our time in this material world. Because just imagine eternity. Now, how can you imagine eternity? You can't. <clears throat> something that doesn't end, something that doesn't begin. Well, that's our existence. That's our nature. We are eternal. That means we've never, never not existed. And in the future, we will never not exist. We will always exist. But in where do we actually exist in the spiritual world? Because in the material world, we get a material body and we see ourselves coming and going. But in the spiritual world, nothing is coming nothing is going, everything is existing in its pure spiritual essence, eternally. So life in this world is not meant to be wasted. Time in this world, time is very valuable for making things that will not exist. Live simply, take what you need to keep your body and soul together and focus on devotion. To the Lord. <laughs> okay, so these are some of the. There are exactly there. Are actually, that that was a number seventeen. There's twenty five altogether. <clears throat> I could quickly read the remaining ones without commenting, and maybe. These will also spark your interest. Number 18, a single fat is neither a guru or a preacher. Number 19, to transform the adverse desires of the jiva to the supreme duty of the most merciful. To rescue one person from the stronghold of Mahamaya is an act of superb benevolence far superior than opening innumerable hospitals. Number 20, unless we're devoted to God, secular, secularism will not leave us. 21, look within, amend yourself, rather than pry into the frailties of others. That's an interesting one. Look within, amend yourself, rather than pry into the frailties of others. In other words, 
correct yourself. Don't be busy trying to find fault with others and trying to correct them. Work on yourself. In this world of Maya, adverse to the Lord, full of trials and tribulations, only patience, humility, and respect for others are our friends for Hari Bhajan. Lord Guru Sundar puts his devotees in various difficulties and associations to test their patience and strength of mind. Success depends on their good fortune. Here's this one. This one is the one that should really find interesting. When faults of others misguide you and delude you, have patience, introspect, find fault in yourself. Know that others cannot harm you unless you harm yourself. And number 25, I wish that every selfless, tender-hearted person of the Gaudiya Math will be prepared to shed 200 gallons of blood for the nourishment of one spiritual corpus of every individual of this world. Okay, so that's Bhakti Siddhanta's words of wisdom. Any comments or questions? Uh, Guru Maharaj on number 20. Go ahead, Diftesh. No, it's okay. Uh, Mataji, you can go ahead first. Thank you. Uh, Guru Maharaj on number 23, it says. So the Lord Gaurasundar puts his devotees in various difficulties and associations to test their patience and strength of mind. Success depends on their good fortune. Uh, what is this good fortune uh, comprised of? Is it the mercy of uh, Vaishnav's guru and uh, their own level of Krishna consciousness? Or how, how would you define this good fortune? Mm. There may be there may be variable definitions. <laughs> In other words, you're being tested, and you're getting a test of patience and a test of strength of mind. So then you have to own up to the test. And if you're successful, that's your good fortune. If you're not, then the good fortune didn't manifest. So it's a little scary. We, we want to get this good fortune. We don't want to fail the test. So how to get this good fortune? Depend on Krishna. But there's another element here. And as Prabhupada said, that this movement is meant for those who are intelligent. So intelligence is, a, is another part of our good fortune. And then again, the question is, where do you get intelligence from? Guru, sadhu, shastra. So your good fortune means to access the intelligence you need, the abilities you need to, uh, with, to be successful in dealing with difficulties that test our strength of mind, that test our patience. Mm -hmm. um, that was hard for me to understand, Guru Maharaj. Would you explain? I know, it's, it's, uh, it's so easy to understand, but it's hard for you to understand because you're thinking you're not listening correct careful because you can't hear what i'm saying it's hard for you to understand you you ever you already have a mindset of what this means and therefore whatever i'm saying doesn't imprint completely on your on, on your consciousness you're put into a difficult situation your your patience is being tested your strength of mind that means how you deal, how strong you are in this situation, mentally. And so how do you, uh, you know, how do you succeed? 
Well, the success is your, your effort. If your effort falls short, you weren't successful. If your effort was, but then again, to access the needed elements for success, that's part of your good fortune. If you become bewildered by the situation and can't access the means to overcome it or to withstand it or to rise above it or to learn from it, then uh, you, you failed. In other words, you, your good fortune didn't manifest. So Krishna consciousness is our good fortune. So where, where can we find our good fortune? Guru, Shadow, and Shastra. But intelligence is required in this one. This one is where, where, where intelligence is required. Because yes, you can't always you can't always deal with the same situation in the same way. And Srila Prabhupada said, if you don't have intelligence, then get it from someone who has it. Yeah, it's available. Someone or, yeah, Krishna. Take Krishna's intelligence, take Guru's intelligence, take the intelligence of the Acharyas. If you are not able to access, then your good fortune didn't come. Yes, Guru Maharaj, thank you. Diptesh, you had a question? Yes, Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glory to Srila Prabhupada, all glory to you, Maharaj. Now, those were wonderful, powerful, uh, condensed PowerPoints. <laughs> so, thank you for that. Uh, I had one question uh, regarding one of the points, which is chanting the names of Krishna is bhakti. Mm. So, whilst I understand that in a way that that is pure bhakti, you know, and, and but, and I've also heard, I can't remember, I was trying to recall where I heard it uh, somewhere or read it somewhere, that the term bhakti can only be applied to Krishna. It cannot be applied to demigods um, uh, or, or any other persons and things like that, or, or let's say demigod worship. Would yeah, that be correct? Yeah, it's in, the it's in the Bhagavad Gita and it's in the, um, the sixth chapter, the last verse in the sixth chapter. Yoginam apisar vesham magatindranatmanaham pajita pajite one who abides in me in devotional service is considered by me to be the highest of all. He's a yogi. So in that purport, Prabhupada talks about bhaja. Bhaja means to worship. So he says, worship is only for the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So when it is referred to as worship of the demigods, what would that be referred to as? That's, that's, that's for material gain. Therefore, it's, it goes on as some form of worship, but the, the desire is to gain something material from that activity, either through prayer or the designated ways that the demigods are worshipped. But that's not real worship. It's more like it's more like business. The prayer and the worship is my payment. And what the material benefit is the is the merchandise. So you can't call that bhajan or worship <laughs> or bhakti. <laughs> Mm 
It's simply material. So in that case, this is clear then bhakti can only be applied to the Supreme Person in, in yeah, the right exactly. way. Yeah, yeah. you can get a, a broader explanation of that from that verse 647, which is the last verse in the sixth chapter. Nice purport, Prabhupada illustrates this point clearly. Thank you, Maharaj. I'll refer to it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Maharaj, I have another question. Uh, probably uh, look at the time, but at, maybe at some point would it be uh, possible, or, or it's my request, if if you can explain the thirteen upper sampradayas uh, briefly. Uh, probably not today because of the time constraint, but that is something that Bhakti Vinod you know, Thakur and then Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati also clearly explained and delineated in the preaching yeah. works i know i know about where that's located in detail and it's in the uh, biography written by bhakti prakash maharaj on the life of bhakti siddhanta where those 13 asampradayas are listed and all the details of their type of worship and activities are explained are, are mentioned. So, otherwise, what you find in the standard literature that we have is just a listing of them. <clears throat> now, Prabhupada uh, sometimes speaks a little bit about one of them, but you don't find anywhere a detailed explanation of their activities, their origins, their worship, like that. Only in that one place that I know, which is somewhere in that three volume set by Bhakti Prakash Maharaj on the, on the life of Srila Bhakti Siddhartha. You've seen that work? Uh, I was searching through it today, because um, contemplating from yesterday about Bhakti Siddhartha Maharaj and uh, I, I located in there somewhere, but it's not very visible on the internet. And uh, meaning there's a PDF, but document online, but uh, not good readable format at the moment. Mm. I, I don't have the it's, book myself. Yeah, the books, you, know, you could probably order the books. It's, it's, as far as I remember, it's been about 10 years. But when I did read it for the first time, I, I found it extraordinarily interesting. Uh, I couldn't, I mean, I was thinking that every page is full of so much information and knowledge and everything. There was, there was about Bhakti Siddhanta, about his, his devotees, all the listings of some of his the bodies are mentioned, who they were, what they did, where they came from. There was a lot there that you don't find anywhere. Bhakti Gadash Maharaj spent 22 years putting this together, doing research. <laughs> so, yeah. In fact, I had a desire to get them uh, from yesterday, uh, contemplating, and I searched everywhere. It's out of publication at the moment. So hopefully... Electronically, it is available yeah. uh, on Kindle, but book-wise, it's yeah. out of publication. Yeah, um, I know it's very popular amongst devotees. Thank you, Maharaj. I, I, I will try to search that literature. Thank you. Yeah, but Prabhupada, was, I was listening to Prabhupada last night. He was talking about the Shine, Shine, Shine community, Shine. 
This is one of the 13 that are listed. And he was talking about them. They still exist in, in, in the UK. And that was, of course, that when Prabhupada's lecture was in 1972, he was talking, he was saying the Shine community still was in the UK. And then there's the Nityananda Vamsas who claim to be uh, relatives or followers of Lord Nityananda, family members. And then there is the, uh, and you, when you read, you'll find most of their activities are just mixed with, with material principles and even sinful activities. There's not only Tantra in there, there's two kinds of Tantra. There's right hand Tantra, which is, can be used for worship. And, but the, there's also some left hand Tantra. Left hand Tantra is, is, is usually sinful and it's in the mode of ignorance. Mm -hmm. You'll find some of that in there in, the, uh, in these uh, Asampradayas. Yeah. This is the this is the feature of history when a very powerful movement comes. If the movement is not kept going by its followers, and somehow it falls into uh, you know disintegration gradually, and there's no successors. And then something else comes up to represent it, which is not representative of it. That happened when Srila Prabhupada left the planet. As soon as Prabhupada left the planet, many deviations came up in our society, so many. And it was for years, there was a struggle to reestablish what Prabhupada said. And then it took years to really to help to reestablish that, and that still is not fully reestablished. Well, that's a phenomenon when a great, great acharya leaves, or even the Lord. Just like when Krishna was here, when Krishna left, Kali Yuga came in full force. <laughs> so yeah, that happens. And so these asampradayas came right at the end when the Vaishnavas were somewhat strewn throughout different places, but there wasn't much of much unity left. As Chaitanya Mahaprabhu left, many of his followers, they also followed and left. And there wasn't much succession developed after that. It wasn't until Bhakti Vinod Thakur came and uh, after reading Chaitanya Charitamrita, he was formerly a Shakta. And following the different Shakta groups. But then after reading CC, his whole life changed. And then he understood and became fully dedicated to bringing Lord Chaitanya's mission back. And he worked tirelessly establishing various types of societies and writing so many books. But then he realized, you know, he was practically a lone ranger. There wasn't much support, hardly at all. Therefore, at one point he prayed to the Lord, please send someone from your personal, uh, you know, entourage to, to assist in spreading your mission. And lo and behold, that was his son, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. So Bhakti Siddhanta Swam Saraswati was a gigantic pillar that reestablished the whole foundation of Krishna consciousness in the world. And he did it in India, but he knew that this was just the beginning. He had to do it worldwide. And so he tried to empower as many of his disciples to take that mission worldwide. And many of them tried. Some went to London, some went to Burma, some went to France, some went to Germany. And all of them came back with little or no real 
results. But only when our Srila Prabhupada went to America did it really take off. So there was one person who actually did the work. Bhakti Siddhanta was the vanguard, the force that made it all happen. It was by his desire, his writings, his teachings, which really, really, and he took a lot of it from his father, Bhakti Vinoda Those two together were the foundation of reestablishing Lord Chaitanya's movement. And Srila Prabhupada was the one who actually did it, spread it around the world. It's a great history if you study it, but you'll see there's 150 years gap where there was practically very little or no activities of Lord Chaitanya's mission left in the world. They practically got lost. Only Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur was practically the last one. He lived in the late 1600s. Mm -hmm. After that, there wasn't men, Baladev Vidya Bhushan, there was just a few Vaishnavas scattered in different places. Only when Bhakti Vinod Thakur made a, you know, a, a real concerted effort to reestablish it by writing so many books. And he really, he reestablished the authenticity of the Srimad Bhagavatam in a wonderful speech, which is now written in the form of a, a small little pamphlet. It's about 70 pages. It's called the Bhagavad. Once, once that was out, people started to again reappreciate, at least in India, Srimad Bhagavatam. Before, Bhagavatam was seen as some uh, some folk tales that are that are communicated to one from from grandfather to grandchildren in the evening time. <laughs> so. We owe everything to Bhakti Vinod Thakur and Bhakti Siddhanta for re, to revitalizing, reestablishing, re-sparking the whole mission of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, which had been com practically completely lost. You know, it'd be a wonderful service for someone to investigate this history by doing a study. You can actually this would be a, an interesting book to write. How Lord Chaitanya's movement developed up to a certain point and then what brought it down? How did it stay down? How did these Amsapradayas actually develop? Because that's what happens. People hear about something authentic and then want to imitate that, but they usually don't know how to, even if they're good intentioned. But a lot of these sampradayas, these asampradayas, were not good intentioned. They were simply looking for some kind of prestige that comes by way of spiritual focus, feel spiritual activities. And you can see that when you read and hear about their activities. That would be a great service for someone to do that study. It's been done in piecemeal but it hasn't been done in a very, what we say, uh, you know, by putting all the books that are available together and delineating all of the histories from the Acharyas, from the time of Lord Chaitanya's departure to the present, or to active to Bhakti Vinod Thakuri, you get a little insight of what happened. Right now, we're, we're also, we're seeing after Srila Prabhupada is left, we're, we're fighting, devotees are fighting to keep Prabhupada's, you know, teachings foremost, even within our society. There are people within our society that want to change Prabhupada's things. They want to add things to Prabhupada. They want to put they want to put Prabhupada on a level with other things that, that are being introduced. So this fight still is going on to this day. How to keep pure true religious principles foremost? It's a struggle. <laughs> 
Bhakti Siddhanta was he was valiant, and he I mean he his life was even threatened by his attempt to reestablish Lord Chaitanya's teachings. They were, Prabhupada tells the story how you know he was attacking the caste the caste Brahmins the caste Goswamis were claiming allegiance to devotion. But they were mostly doing just ritualistic performances in order to gain monetary success, monetary gain. And how Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati was relentless in attacking these groups. And they became so angry and disturbed by him that they got together, a large group got together and made a plot to kill Bhakti Siddhanta. They approached one police officer with a, a gift of 25,000 rupees. They said to the police officer, we want to do something to Bhakti Siddhanta. So please here, take this money and do not do anything against us. The police officer listened. He was actually the police chief. And he said, actually, we engage in such activities, but I cannot do that for a saintly person. So he refused. And then he went and told Bhakti Siddhanta, take care, there are men out to cause you great harm. So that's what, that's what he had a face at that time. By Krishna's grace, he was protected. Yeah. And Bhakti Siddhanta established a tremendous army of sannyasis. He had 60 sannyasis who were traveling all over India, opening up like diorama exhibits, putting Lord Chaitanya's <laughs> footprints <clears throat> in stone in various places around India. You can still go even all the way as far as, far as the... Um, Oh, um, can't think of that temple. It's in Kerala. It's the uh, famous temple in Kerala. And there is the Padapita of Lord Chaitanya there, the footprints. Mm -hmm. So yeah, practically Bhakti Siddhanta started a revolution on the Indian continent, spreading Krishna consciousness because he was an empowered representative of the Lord who came to do that mission. But then again, after he left, you know, then deviations came in and it wasn't, Prabhupada had to break from the Gaudiya Math in order to preach his mission. When Prabhupada tried to establish Krishna consciousness in the West, he didn't get any support from his God brothers, none. He was a lone ranger. He wanted to bring them in. He wanted to make it a joint effort to spread Krishna consciousness in the West, knowing it was his spiritual master's mission. And they all knew that was Bhakti Siddhanta's mission. Yeah, the Adi Keshiva temple. Thank you, that's, that's correct. Um, no, there's one other temple too, besides the Adi Keshiva temple, which I'm thinking of. It's a, it's a deity that's lying down. Adi Keshav is also a Padmanabh temple. The Padmanabh temple. Yeah, it's in Kerala. Yeah. Padmanabh. Not Padmana, Padmanabh. <laughs> Padmanabh. And uh, yeah. And so Prabhupada tried so hard, you can read the history, to bring his god brothers together in support of preaching in the West. And he didn't even care. He didn't want any credit. He was willing to give them any positions, you know, they could take over. But none of them wanted to help Prabhupada. They thought he was just, <laughs> you know, just wasting his time. So Prabhupada did it alone. <laughs> so Prabhupada had a break from his, from his, from his society and, and reestablish the society, the society carrying on the Gaudiya Math in the terms of the ISKCON movement. So you see how this is the history of, you know, religion. 
religion, real religion is always under attack by pretentious religion and by material forces. It's constantly under attack. So to keep Srila Prabhupada in the center, to keep his teachings as foremost, to keep his uh, instructions as the guiding principle for our movement, it's not easy. Although devotees are aware of Prabhupada, there are others who have other ideas on how this movement should go on, which is a lot of times not what Prabhupada wanted. It's clear. So you, you'll find that this is, the, this is the history. So if anyone wants to do that work, you know, see Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, the Supreme Lord himself, he established Chaitanya Mahaprabhu established Krishna consciousness throughout the entire Indian subcontinent, subcontinent. Everybody, practically everybody, the Lord went, he traveled for six years all throughout India, spreading the Sankirtan movement. That's a great history. But then when he left, you know, irreligion started to come in. <laughs> because this is the material world. And there's people who don't want real religion. They want something watered down, something where they can gain something from it, something material, something uh, mixed, mixed spirituality, karma mishra bhakta, jnana mishra bhakta, so many Mishra bhaktas, you know, mixed bhaktas. So, yeah. So what Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati did, and which our Srila Prabhupada continued to do, is really the saving grace of this world right now. And we owe everything to Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati as the, you know, the general. <laughs> who really, really pushed his soldiers to preach Krishna consciousness everywhere in the world, but they didn't do it. <laughs> they didn't do it. As soon as he left, there was so much infighting about who's going to be the next Acharya. And the, the properties of the Gaudiya Math, the Gaudiya Math split into different little mosques all around India. It was no longer united. It was just a different mosque, all calling themselves the Gaudiya Mahath. Unity was destroyed. So yeah, so even though a great Acharya comes and he establishes so much and people become very dedicated to him and because of their dedication, it spreads. But after when he leaves, that's the struggle. That's the struggle to keep. And we saw that with Prabhupada. As soon as Prabhupada left, 1978, so many deviations came in in our society. Fortunately, there were some very sincere devotees who really worked hard to reestablish what Prabhupada had established after had been somewhat attacked by uh, by. So it's sub-religious ideas and principles. Mm -hmm. This is the material world. <laughs> Thank you, Maharaj, for the wonderful discourse on this topic. History. <laughs> yes. History and present situation. <laughs> There's those who don't want Krishna conscious. They want something along with Krishna conscious. But this movement is meant and will only go on by purity. As soon as the devotees fall from the level of pure, they don't have to be pure. 
in heart, they have to be pure in intention. That's the point. When the intentions are pure, then the heart gradually follows. If the intentions are not pure, then people will go off in different directions. Okay, so thank you for your inspirational questions. Guru Maharaj, Namrata has a question. She says she offers her humble obeisances and she says, my question is very basic, but it baffles me a little bit. What's the difference between love and bhakti? Bhakti means pure love. Bhakti means love with service. Love and devotion. But devotion is shown by service. So bhakti means to love and serve the Lord and in order to please the Lord. Through service with devotion, one develops bhakti or love. The love, love definition in this world is always, is not a real definition of love. It's, it's a mixture of, of sentiment, affection, and personal gain. Therefore, it's not real love. Bhakti is real love, because love for Krishna is the, is, is the essence of love. Uh, thank you, Guru Maharaj. Uh, there is another question, I think. Vivek Prabhu has raised his hand. Vivek Prabhu, you can unmute and ask, please. Namrata's got a follow-up. She's writing, wrote something on the chat. What does she say? So there would be a very thin line to understand the difference between the two. I think it's clear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you actually are speaking about love, then you have to speak about you have to you have to give it the, def the definition of bhakti. But if you haven't, but if it's not the definition of, if it's, if it's not, oh, let me see, who is that? Uh, yeah, it was Bhishma Dev. Bhishma said, Dev said, love means to repose all of one's affection in one person. Mm -hmm. Bhishma Dev gives that definition. So to propose all of one affection in Krishna is real love. Love in this world is mixed. There is some love, but it's mixed. The closest thing to pure love in this world, and Prabhupada would say it quite often, is the love that a mother has for her little child who is completely dependent and helpless. That is, that is pure. The mother is only thinking about the good of the child. The child cannot really reciprocate the mother's love. That's pure love. When love doesn't look for something in return, then it's love. If it's you look, if someone is looking for something and giving love in order to get something, and that love is, is mixed with personal motivation. Therefore, in the true sense of the definition, it's not real love.
These are these are statements made by Rupa Goswami and uh, Srila Prabhupada's lectures describing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Would you like to take Vivek Prabhu's question, Guru Maharaj? Yeah. Please go ahead, Vivek Prabhu. Go ahead, ask your question. I'm listening. Vivek Prabhu, are you there? Or should we move to the next person you can come back and ask later? Guru Maharaj, I think he's uh, stepped out or something, but Radha Bhakti has raised her hand. Would you like to take her question? Uh, yes, please. Mm -hmm. Hare Radha Krishna, Guru Maharaj. Yes, thank you, Mataji. Uh, Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Um, sorry, I'm just saying, Vivek Prabhu, no, we, we couldn't hear you. Do you want to give it another try before I ask? Okay, maybe I'll, I'll ask my question and you can either try to fix your audio or put it in the chat. Um, Guru Maharaj, I hope this is a, a quick one. I was speaking to somebody recently. Um, when I, I joined today's class a little bit late, I think you were reading maybe around 13 or 14, and you were saying that the path of devotional service is fraught with difficulty. And that's always been something that has fascinated me and uh, I resonate with. Um, and I was reflecting, I was speaking to somebody about, somebody with mentioned a class that a sannyasi gave on each of the stages of bhakti and how as we progress on the path of bhakti in order to graduate to the next stage, there's always some kind of test. And that kind of test manifests as some kind of extreme difficulty, but when you get through it, you kind of make it to the other side. I haven't yet heard the class, but I was just wondering if you know where we can read more about that. And um, if you can maybe just say a few words, I know we're at time, but maybe just a few words on that. Hmm. Where you can read about these tests that come by way of advancement? Yes, Grimraj, and particularly each, each of the nine phases of bhakti, what the test is to graduate to the next phase. Hmm. Well, I guess the tests are not something that are what we say a formalized way of testing. It's just according to the individual. Obviously, it would have to be according to the individual because test means to see what you need to advance and what you need in order to advance to remove. So the tests are either accepting something that you haven't or getting rid of something that you have. That's the tests. But then again, that's how Krishna orchestrates that. And that's an individual thing in the life of the devotee. But we can understand that this is what happens. So that tests may come in different, way, different ways to different people either based on their attachments or based on what they're lacking. As, as Krishna says, I carry what you lack and I preserve what you have. One who remains fixed in devotional service, he carries what, they, what you lack. 
So the principle is that, you know, Krishna is there to arrange for you to move forward. And the verse is Tatek Nukampa Shusha Mikshyamanam Bhujane Vat Kritam Vipakam Vidvava Hubir Viradana Maste Jiveti Yo Mupi Pradesha Dayavak. That's the uh, the verse that the devotees resonate with when they are finding themselves in these tests, knowing that it's coming from Krishna as a way for purification, a way for increased knowledge, a way for increased detachment. A, a way for uh, increased dependence, like that. If you study your own life, you can see where you get stuck. We get stuck a lot of times because we do the same thing over and over again, and we expect different results. <laughs> but then again, we get the same results, but because we're habituated to acting and thinking in a certain way, we fall into that same pattern. So these tests are meant to break us out of these things by giving us some suffering that comes by way of our wrong activities or by helping us to understand where we need to focus in order to make. So for some people, maybe their focus needs to be that they have to be less critical of other devotees or not critical at all. Others may have to work on the quality of their chanting. Others may have to um, develop more humility. Others may have to learn to become more tolerant. Others may have to depend more on on uh, Srila Prabhupada's words, instead of depending on what goes on in the outside world as information. So there's so many different ways that you may have be tested on. How, that, how Krishna brings that about usually comes by way of difficulties. Only when you can't get it, it comes, becomes difficult. Usually Krishna shows you exactly how what you need to do i give you I, I can use myself for an example i don't mind using myself so here i am in slovenia and i've been here since july but i took two times i left once in the mid-august and once in in the end of september beginning of october but it was clear to me that krishna didn't want me to leave by, by what happened when I left each time. And then he fi I finally got convinced that Krishna doesn't want me to travel. So that's my situation presently. Traveling will come up and I'm waiting for Krishna to give me the green light. But right now I can understand the red light is there. So I'm not gonna move until I understand what Krishna wants me to do. So I made some independent actions and by based on those independent actions i could see that these were what you know, what krishna didn't want me to do and he was also showing me stay where you are and take advantage of what i'm giving you rather than looking for somewhere else to find what you think you need or you think you have to do so that's, that's, that's one of the ways that Krishna tests you. He shows you through your own mistakes and he also gives you intelligence to understand if you're trying to learn, that is. But sometimes we're so determined to do the things the way we want to do that we can't get it. <laughs> So how those steps go are just, as you mentioned, tests. <laughs> Thank you, Gurmaj. I also really appreciate your personal example. Thank you so much. That's the only way I could try to answer your question in a more clear way. You know, I traveled for 
since 1985 to 2019, I traveled. <laughs> I didn't stop. I was constantly traveling all everywhere. But then again, Krishna put the brakes on. <laughs> so he did it through maybe a situation where everyone had to slow down. But still, I had, I still had a leadway to continue. But, but then again, when I used my leeway, I can see it wasn't to my benefit or what Krishna wanted me to do. So, you know, we learn sometimes through trial and error. One thing you should understand is Krishna is constantly directing his devotee according to how best they can proceed. But that understanding depends on our sincerity. When we're really sincere, everything becomes easy to understand when we make mistakes, when we do the wrong thing, when we act the wrong way. If we're not sincere, we'll simply take it as just you know, something that's happening, that's all. Even in reflecting in my, in my own life, those obstacles that forced me to grow spiritually in retrospect are always, there's an element of joy, but definitely not, not during the struggle. But in retrospect, you can see Krishna's hand sometimes and it's really um, transcendental, mystical. Yeah, that's most that's mostly the case. It's in retrospect, because in retrospect, we're now in a different position. And now we can see the benefit. Or we can, we can feel the joy of act, acting according to how the Lord wanted us to act. That, that's another element of joy that when we are connected to Krishna accordingly, there's that joy and peace and happiness. So he works either through activities or he works through, as you mentioned, certain um, anarthas that we have that need to be removed. <laughs> Thank you, Garmesh. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Jai Ho. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Vivek Prabhu, are you ready with your question? Hare Krishna Mataji, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to you, Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, uh, my question was uh, in this one of the sixth, uh, one of the word of wisdom, like sixth, I think it was sixth one where you mentioned uh, those favored by God find their path set by thorns. Yeah. So um, um, the question Maharaj, like when real problem comes in our life, like we really get very bewildered and confused. So how to prepare ourselves? Of course, uh, this will only come when we are really prepared when Krishna will feel eligible for that particular things. But how to really prepare ourselves by like when this problem comes and then we don't feel like, okay, whatever Krishna is doing, it's really good for us. Uh -huh. Well, it takes faith. And it, stay, and, it and it takes you to stay on, the, stay on the path despite what happens. If you don't have that faith, then you'll you'll look for answers outside of Krishna consciousness, or solutions, or won't be able to accept what's happening as something you can grow from. You have to understand the path of bhakti is all auspicious. There's nothing inauspicious about bhakti. Even the reverses are opportunities for advancement when we have that faith and when we see them that way. But then again, it requires some 
contemplation, some intelligence, maybe even some discussion with others to really um, reveal what's happening. Why is it happening? What can I gain from it? So, you know, sometimes you, we find people will criticize us and will immediately become offended or reject what they say. But then when we think, hmm, all right, maybe I didn't like it and I didn't like where it came from, but there's something that I can learn from it. What is it? Obviously, it wouldn't have happened to me unless there's some benefit in it. So where is that benefit to be found? So the first question is not, well, it shouldn't have happened. The question is, why is it happening? Until you accept it, you can't understand it. Or you can't begin to understand it. Once you accept it, then you can begin to understand it. And then you'll see that just like someone asked Srila Prabhupada, there's this old saying that comes from the secular world that <clears throat> a cloud has a silver lining. Obviously, a cloud is meant to be something that is uh, not good. <clears throat> But a silver lining means that if you look deeper, you'll see that there's some benefit from this cloud. So when the devotees ask, is this, is this true that all clouds have a silver lining? Prabhupada said, no. <laughs> well, what did he mean? He meant not for those who are not on devotional service. Those who are on, not are on devotional service you know, they're working with the material energy. So they're just trying to juggle the different uh, effects of the modes of material nature. Yeah. And therefore, they exchange one form of reactions to another form, that's all. So where's the silver lining? But for a devotee, because they're on the path, because they take shelter of Krishna, because they depend on Krishna, there is something beneficial that is is happening right now, although we see it in the opposite way. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. I think so. It takes, it takes faith, it takes contemplation, it takes prayer, and I would also say it takes some intelligence too. And that intelligence may not always be within us, it may come by way of speaking with others in regards to what's happening. So in adverse situation, Guru Maharaj, our meditation should be, Krishna gave us strength so we can handle this situation, what you have created, and we don't we lose either, the faith. Either learn how to tolerate it or learn how to gain from it. Tolerance is also a form of gain but there's a higher principle that there is something there that will move your bhakti forward. If you gain faith in Krishna, that's, that's, that's advancement. We all have faith, but how much, how much is that faith? It's all in ring. It's all in proportion to how much we've surrendered. Your faith is in proportion to how much you surrender to Krishna. If you have complete surrender, do you have complete faith? And complete faith brings complete surrender. But if we're holding back on something, then our faith is less and our surrender is also less. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. It's really, really helpful. Very powerful. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Vivek. Nice. Uh, yeah. So don't get discouraged because as long as you stay on the path of bhakti, you're guaranteed success. 
Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you. I guarantee your success was you'll reach a platform where you become always joyful and transcend all of these difficulties. Jai, Jai. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare you. Did we uh, exhaust the questions, Sri Devi? Yes, Guru Maharaj, there are no more raised hands. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for elaborating on each of these wonderful lessons from uh, His Divine Grace, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Maharaj. Each one of these points, we can just contemplate on it and really go in depth into it. So uh, we very much appreciate your giving us the overview and guiding us to understand these various points. I'll send it to, to someone who can uh, distribute it to the rest of the devotees. Who can I send it to? I think Lavanya is uh, always very prompt about sending everything. So maybe Lavanya can then send it to all of us. She there? Mm -hmm. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. I wish to share the Prabhupada. Yes, Guru Maharaj, I can, I can do that. Yeah, I'll send you this list. Uh, there's two lists, the one I read from yesterday and the one today. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> I'll send you the one from today, yes, Guru Maharaj. unless you want both lists. So, uh, sure, Guru Maharaj. Thank you so much. Do you want both? Both would be nice, Guru Maharaj, because I could access the second one, but not the first one. Okay, the first one and the second one, there are similarities, but there are so are many, many differences. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Guru Maharaj. Shri Prabhupada Ki Shri Harinam Sankirtan Ki Jai. Thank you very much, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj.